There's been floods in Germany. There's been a heat wave in the US. Um, even as we are recording this, I'm being told that the city of Mumbai has come to a halt because of incessant rain. So can I start, uh, if I may, with Dr. Pradeep? He has developed a pesticide removal technology, which is uh, basically it has helped over 10 million people across the country. And what we are talking about is arsenic contamination. I'd like to share a personal anecdote. I have reported, uh, you know, on the river Ganga and the pollution levels there. And the Ganga Brahmaputra Delta is in fact considered to be the hotbed for arsenic contamination. More than 20 uh, states in the country are affected by this problem. It is not just a toxic, uh, uh, a toxic chemical uh, which finds its way into the groundwater, but also in places uh, where crops are grown. So also, uh, you know, in the food that we eat. And I've come across communities where they have skin issues, they have kidney disorders, all kinds of issues because of arsenic contamination. Sadly, this doesn't always make it to our headline. If I may ask you, what is this technology that you've developed? And are we in the future, uh, you know, going to have a map of India, which is completely rid of our scenic contamination? Uh, Bahar, uh, in fact, we are ready with uh, technology and solution that will wipe out this arsenic from our country in the next uh, three, four years. We are right now supplying arsenic-free water to 1.2 million people every day. And uh, for those of uh, you who are watching youngsters, these plants which are supplying arsenic-free water, you can watch them on your mobile. You can see their data on the mobile. So I see the country, uh, you know, is a few years from now, every new can corner of the country uh, data on water will be collected online. Now, what is the core of this? I have all along said that uh, advanced materials is the solution for clean water problems. Arsenic, you mentioned, is now an 108-year-old problem. We knew about this existing in, in water. In our country, yeah, we knew about this for about uh, some 50, 60 years or so. But we haven't found solutions, affordable solutions. I should emphasize this word affordable uh, solutions because we didn't have the right materials which could solve this problem without the use of electricity, without the need of piped water supply, and all of those technology, so-called uh, technology-enabled things. So we want really low-hanging technology. And such a technology, we said, it should be something like less than five paisa per liter of clean water. We are currently supplying clean water at 2.81 paisa per liter. And that conforms to all the US EPA standards. And that is our material, that's our solution. And I have all along said that such solutions uh, should come from, from our own uh, research, largely because this is not a problem that is faced by other countries. So uh, this is true of many other areas also, uh, fluoride or uranium or mercury or many other areas. Uh, so advanced materials is the key. And one should invest heavily uh, on that. And the way that we progress, if every child in this country is aware of this problem, these problems, we will be finding even advanced, more, even more advanced solutions. In right. The right. If I can just ask you quickly, what is this technology? Because while technology is one thing, accessibility is another issue because it's often the poorest communities. There is the issue of equity and access to technology. So how are you making this technology accessible to the poorest of the poor? In, in our country, water is, is something that government gives and people are unwilling to pay for it. And in fact, it's not unwilling, they, are, they can't afford it. Uh, and uh, very many people who are faced with this uh, problem, they earn something like 120 rupees a day 
that's all that is that is there for a family and so it is not uh, expected that they would pay and therefore villages today are uh, are implementing such solutions and those solutions uh, with the villages resources available if we can if we can supply the best possible water as i told you with 2.81 paisa per liter it is possible uh, that with about 50 rupees spent on a villager every month we can ensure clean water and this is something that governments can do yes and right to clean water uh, is it should be the right of every citizen in this country but i'd like to first now bring in my second guest dr amitabh saran so uh, dr saran how is the work that you do how is that going to help bring down pollution levels uh, am i looking at a possibility that 10 years 15 years 20 years from now uh, we you know we we have the 100 most polluted cities in the world in our country will this number become less will delhi ever face a situation where we have clean air days the problem is really grave and we need to be on a war footing to be able to address that problem i think the most fundamental thing in our country is the realization of this problem 1.2 million people die every year in this country because of poor air quality 25% of which is attributed to road transport which means 3 lakh people die every year in this country because of the vehicles you and i are driving this is an undisputed statistics 14 of the top 15 worst polluted cities of the world are in india 10000 people died because of the covid um, you know pandemic there was a national lockdown 3 lakh people die every year because of poor air quality we do not discuss this on page 17 of the newspaper right things have to be done on a war footing and this is exactly what my company alti green a company that had started back in 2013 started looking at but we realized that the technology has to be built for our geography it's very clear that the needs of our geography which is india and the emerging markets emerging markets of south asia africa south america the needs are very different whether you look at environmental concerns whether you look at um, you know unprofessional driving behaviors whether you look at the road infrastructure whichever way you look at it these are realities and a 130 year old diesel fossil fuel technology has made it here so when we look at making electric vehicles in this country we need to make sure that they are vehicles that can compete against at the same platform against a fossil fuel vehicle only then can we expect their accelerated adoption and we've also realized that we are not in the transportation business we are in the peace of mind business i noticed that uh, you you uh, Uh, you've developed a technology called Hypix, which can be basically installed on petrol and diesel cars, and I'm told it can save nine million tons of greenhouse gas emissions. So, not only are you solving the pollution problem, you're perhaps also solving the climate problem. Uh, and uh, interestingly, it says by 2029. So that's like eight years away. Uh, so, uh, how is this going to be possible? Yeah, so uh, you know, fossil fuels have been around for a long time, and they came in for a specific reason. But when you look at the future, it's clear that every person in the automobile industry has to start thinking otherwise. There are enough countries who've come down with regulation. Government of India came down with regulations to say we will not have BS five. We move directly from the emission standard BS four directly to BS six, and the government meant that they would implement it. it doesn't matter whether there's a pandemic or no pandemic so it's clear that we have to move away from fossil fuel i guess question is why not cng why not lpg why not biodiesel why not the others right why electricity and one thing that always comes in people's mind is yeah electricity is also coming from coal grids boss you know so you are just shifting the problem from one place to another to a certain extent that is true however if you look at the mandates of the government and how much we are pushing towards renewable sources of electricity i mean when we started back in 2011 2012 then 91% of india's electricity was coming from coal grids today the number is in the 70s 
So there's a lot being done to make sure that we can move away from that, number one. Number two, most of the people who are dying today are not dying at places where electricity is being generated. Most of them are dying in overpopulated cities. So the only way to make this happen is that at least where this population of these vehicles is so dense, that's where we need to clean it. And technologies like electric vehicles. So one thing that's important, and I think the youngsters are really going to love this, is that you know, electric vehicles are just very simple. You know, in a normal car, the cars that we drive every day on the road, they're about 1,700 moving parts. 1,700 moving parts. In an electric vehicle, wild guess, just 20. You know, it's a very, very simple thing. It's complicated because it does the same work. But in terms of its organization, it's very simple. Because it's simple, it's very efficient. A fossil fuel vehicle is about 25% efficient, which means that 75% of the fuel that you burn doesn't go in propelling the vehicle forward. This is a hard fact. Electric vehicles are 90% efficient. And hence the usage of the energy towards transportation or mobility is much higher. It's an order of magnitude higher, which is where we want to be. And that's how the technology that we've built allows us to do that. And I know that the you know, all electric vehicles and the push from the government of India is forcing us to move more and more in that direction. I think you'll actually start seeing a lot of movement in that direction. The segments of the automobile industry will change. I think that to me is the most important thing. Instead yes. of focusing on a segment that might adopt much later in the future, we should adopt, we should go after those segments that are more and more akin to adoption of electric vehicles. I think that would be key. This, um, at a time, you know, as we remind ourselves, we are in the midst of a global pandemic. There is a slowdown in, with industry. And yet you remain optimistic that we have the technology. We have the solutions uh, to scale down some of our environmental problems. So, Dr. Pradeep, would you say we have the requisite government policies in place to address, for instance, um, water contamination? What is it that we need to do right now to secure our future selves? Uh, look at Yamuna. Look at every every year, you, you see this frothing Yamuna. And what are we doing about it? And so we have rules, uh, but we don't implement them. And uh, we are talking about, we just now are talking about arsenic. And you are talking about the 10 dif uh, 20 different states. So, you know, I'm from Tamil Nadu. Arsenic has come here. You know why yeah. arsenic has come here? Arsenic has come here because of our, our agricultural policies. It came through our inorganic fertilizers. Yes. And rice requires phosphorus. And for a chemist, arsenic is in the same group as phosphorus. And along with phosphorus comes this arsenic and it comes because we chose the, the cheap phosphorus that is available from somewhere. And so, and we keep digging or we keep going deeper and deeper for water and in other parts of the country, and we get arsenic. And we put rice in the wrong place, which requires a lot of water. So if you start asking this question, do we have policies or can we correct those policies? Yes, there are a, several corrections required. But at the same time, there are a large number of policies that we are having, which are not implemented as well. So this is a combination of all that. And every time we want to give more subsidies, we want to make electricity free. So of course, uh, people will go for uh, higher and higher horsepower pumps and they will suck uh, water. Now, to me, it is largely a problem of water literacy. Young people should get into water because water is challenging. So there are issues of this kind. Water literacy is important. Institutions should look at it. There are a, there are a few courses on water, but do we have a good program on water? We don't. So we need to address this at the very basic level. While we were just talking about it, I was telling you water is just a triatomic molecule. Very simple. But it is very complex. And in fact, 
that is a subject on which maximum number of uh, papers are being published even today. And I was just telling you that as I was coming to this, uh, uh, this discussion meeting, people have found uh, a plastic, a water or ice that can be bent, just like it can be bent and it can reform. The second very important policy thing that I should say is that there is a price for water in every product that we use. So there is water in everything. Yes. That is why the 17 sustainability development goals, if you look at 16 of them have water in one way or the other. Yes, and, and we don't put a price on that, I would say. No, we don't put a price on this. So therefore, when we say that uh, when we have a detergent, when we have a soap, there is a price and that everybody can see because of the Yamuna problem that I told you about. So therefore, there has to be a national detergent policy. I would say that we have to move towards water positive technologies for the country. All right, that's a great suggestion, a water, water positive okay. policy. I say that there are plenty of important suggestions. One major thing is a water shift towards water positive technologies. And secondly, children should be aware that water is the essence, mother of all. Fantastic. Two great suggestions coming there from Dr. Pradeep. Dr. Saran, if I can now bring you into the conversation, I think water, again, uh, related to electricity. Electricity comes from coal, another industry which, ha which, massive, which has a massive uh, imprint, I would say, on the use of water. Um, and when it comes to the electric vehicle policy, I know we have that in place. Would you say government policy right now supports the work that you do? I do strongly believe that uh, I think the government is very keen on doing this. And this is not just in India. Unfortunately for me, I think the Indian government is looking at it very, very keenly. And this is a global phenomenon that happened. Uh, I mean, three years back, uh, you guys probably heard of the diesel gate scam that happened, you know. So it's not just something that is happening in India. or th This is a global phenomenon, right? Everyone has looked at it and everyone has had problems. The government of India pushed their foot down and said, no, enough is enough. We want to make changes happen. Subsidies is a good way to start, you know, reduction in, um, in, in GST for electric vehicles. Just whatever you can do to accelerate the adoption of electric vehicles while looking at renewable sources of electricity generation. I think both of those are going hand in hand. There's a lot of work being done on chargers, being done on solar charging, so a lot of those allied industries that are also being set up. Um, I'm an entrepreneur, uh, third time entrepreneur. Uh, we are always eternal optimists. That's why we start companies. I am very, very optimistic. I think in India too, GST is one, fame subsidy is the other. State governments are following suit and giving subsidy. I think all these will go a long way in ensuring at least a starting point I think today it's the starting point, which is the problem. Batteries continue to be extremely expensive, uh, but yes. if you want good vehicles, you need those batteries. And hence subsidies go a long way in doing that, cutting down um, you know, import um, duties on certain materials, forcing people to get into manufacturing of components used in electric vehicles in India. I think both those policies uh, are having a positive impact. And like I said, I'm, I'm really optimistic about the way things are shaping up. I'm certain that you know the time for electric vehicles is here and now. I think the only thing I would constantly keep telling everyone and the youngsters who are looking at this and hearing this is that you know focus on something that needs to be done for this geography. Everyone builds products for their geographies and then they try to dump it over here and we become a dumping ground for either products that are extremely expensive. I'm talking about new technology when it comes either yes. too expensive or not good quality enough for our Indian environmental conditions. Build something for this. And if All you right. can, yes. two thumbs up, you will all be successful. So build local, build for local geographical and environmental uh, conditions here in India. I think those are great suggestions from both of you. So look into the future and what do you see? Do you see a world of uh, Dr. Saran, uh, electric vehicles, less pollution? What is it that you're seeing 10, 20 years from now? Clear blue skies. Wonderful. 
Okay. Absolutely. Uh, electric vehicles are the future, not just in, you know, as far as uh, electric vehicles are concerned, but in the sky, drones, all kinds of things, but driven by things that do not require fossil fuels to be burned. Absolutely. 100%. Okay. Clear blue skies is a lovely thought. Dr. Pradeep, what about you? What, what are you seeing in the crystal ball? I see blue water. Uh, blue water, okay. And there is, there is no question. But I should say that technology has been a savior. And we are surrounded by technology. And uh, this is what we are. 21st yes. century is that. And we will see on our mobile phones, water, quality, quantity, and that blue water and the blue sky right on that mobile phone. Because technology is available today to enable that. What pandemic has given us is that we have every child has a mobile phone or a smartphone with him or her. With that, one can look at the world around them if appropriate technology is given to them. I can tell you that two millimeter thin spectrometers are possible today and people have demonstrated that water quality from the, a tap can be measured with this. And if that can happen at 100 rupees, everyone will have that. And that is that crystal ball that you are looking at. While I talk about this, we must ensure that there should not be any technology divide in this. And we should take everybody together on that. And that is a big task ahead. And there, there are policies, et cetera, that one can uh, talk about. I yeah. would leave it there yeah. as, as a great future that is ahead of us. That's, I would say, very optimistic, uh, but I'm glad you, you know, Dr. Pradeep added uh, the issue of equity, because I think in environmentalism, that is hugely lacking technology, which is accessible to all. Water is so unique. If you change just one atom, make it instead of hydrogen, you make heavy hydrogen, deuterium, life will not exist. Yes. It is so unique. And if you disturb it, it is not only disturbing me and you, it is dis disturbing the entire ecosystem. So as a result of this disturbance in water, 50% of the biodiversity has been lost. So I say this water should be given to everyone, including cows and uh, goats and all that. I'd like to end on a more somber note uh, because I've just come back from Rajasthan where, you know, Dr. Saran, you spoke about the, you know, the fact that the future is renewables. I agree. But I think that until we control our consumption levels, until the demand for energy goes down, we will not be rid of our environmental problems. And I'm giving the example of Rajasthan because I uh, came back from this particular place where solar, uh, uh, you know, there are solar power companies uh, that are setting up their plants in the desert, but they are leaving a massive ecological footprint in terms of, uh, you know, uh, the, the grassland habitat there and endangering the lives of the great Indian buster, which is a critically endangered bird. Uh, now, so I do feel that even renewable energy has an environmental footprint. And I think until we address consumption, our consumption levels, until we bring those down, uh, I don't think even our future selves will be rid of these environmental issues. Perhaps in the future, we meet in, as you said, under blue skies, sipping blue water. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.